Goes. It's Chris coming to you live Thursday night. I'm here with my co-host Sammy. Here he is. Hey buddy. Say hello. You get that? Yeah, we're chilling in my kitchen. Sorry for the late start. I have a new baby, new member of the household, so we're very excited. The uh, baby came last week, that's why I missed the show. So I apologize for missing the show last week. But I'm excited to get started with a new topic tonight and share with you my thoughts about junior development and also I'm going to talk about talent tonight. What makes a talented player? What do, you look, what do I look for in a talented player and things like that. Uh, I think we have a problem with my feed here. Let's see, is the feed going through? Maybe, yes. I think our feed is working. Okay, good. So let's get started with the first topic of the night. I'd like to talk about talent. Also, later in the show, we may touch on cheating. I've been writing a lot this week, and one of the articles, I'm actually working on two articles on cheating. One is being published in the New York Tennis Magazine, uh, the issue coming out this month. Hey, Scott, you want to say hi? Go on, say hello. That's my daughter, Scott. So tonight... Just before the show started, I was snuggling my new baby, this baby Ocean, and my daughter had to do her clarinet practice, so I, I said, well, I probably should... Saxophone. Saxophone. <laughs> oh, sorry. She said saxophone. So, oh there was a lot going on in the Lewitt household just before the show started out, but now I'm, I'm starting to settle in and, oh and we'll get going with the program. Guys, I've been appreciating... Everyone who's tuning into the podcast, the podcast is blowing up. We're getting hundreds of listens uh, per week, so my audience is growing. I really appreciate you guys supporting the podcast. We're on iTunes now. We are on SoundCloud and all of the podcasting directories, and we're adding new ones as I learn about them. But we're pretty much everywhere, and I know that people are really loving to watch the show that way. So thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, listen to the show that way. But thank you so much for supporting the, the show that way. And I appreciate everyone who listens and tunes in. And we're going to keep offering that podcast format. I think it's really convenient for everyone. So thank you so much for that. Thank you for the waves, guys. Let's get into the, the program. Without further ado, we talk about talent. Talent is one of those subjects, talent ID is a notoriously difficult subject to, to come to a conclusion about. T talent, if you go to conferences, there, there are experts who specialize in talent and talent ID, and there are many different opinions among coaches about what makes a, a talented player, what, what's important and what is, what is not important. For me, the most important thing that I look for in a young kid, so let's say I have a young player from 5 years old to 10 years old, 11, 12 years old, anywhere in that range, there's a few things that I'm looking for and we can talk about all of them. If you guys have questions about talent, let me know. As always, if you have questions about junior development, let me know. I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. This show is all about answering questions from the audience and also sharing my views on junior development. So, if I have a young kid, little superstar in front of me, the first thing that I'm looking for is probably the eyes and how they connect with the ball. And in my experience, working with a lot of talented young players, many of whom grew up to be top national ranked players, and some of them now are going out in the professional circuit, in my experience, the, the kids who are really gifted with their coordination, they always make a good contact with the ball. It is uncanny. It is in, really an incredible thing to witness as a coach because sometimes you have a kid who really doesn't have good technique. So they may have very bad form and they, they may not have the skills yet but they're somehow able to track the ball and make good contact in the sweet spot of the racket. They're able to manipulate the racket and make a good connection with the ball almost 
perfectly every time, even if you start moving them around. So whether that's in mini tennis or whether you're hitting with them, if they're a little more of an advanced player. So that is probably the first thing that I've, I've observed about talented kids. And even the word talent and talented is a very loaded word now because there's been many, there have been many books in popular culture now about talent, the talent code, for example, and other books like that, which talk about how perhaps talent is more of a learned behavior or an attribute that, you, that is more about hard work. It reflects more on, on your hard work than your actual innate ability. So there's a lot of debate in, in, in our current uh, literature and, and in, in our culture about what exactly talent it is. For me, I'm, I'm talking very practically as a coach on the court what I'm looking for for talent. And the first is probably the eyes and the hands, how the player connects with the ball. And not, I, mean, I, I work with a lot of little kids, so that's kind of my perspective. But you can also see it in older players who are more advanced they usually make a lot of clean contact with the ball. They have tremendous eyes. Another way you can kind of judge that is, for example, if they play well outdoors, players play well in conditions like wind and sun and, and shadows and things like that, they, they tend to have this amazing ability to make good contact with the ball. And, and that, I think, relates to their coordination and their eyes. One second, Sammy needs to go out. Sorry, guys, let me get Sammy out. Sammy, what's the deal here? So, in terms of talent, the eyes and the coordination are, are a huge thing. Hold on, let Sammy out. Sammy's kind of grumpy tonight. What else do I look for? I'll tell you a couple other things that are really important for me in terms of talent identification. So, when I have a young little superstar, little champ in front of me, I'm looking for their speed. I'm looking for how fast they are, how quickly they can cover the court. So a lot of times what I'll do is, I have some tests that I do with little kids, like little informal tests. And I think just because I've played with a lot of young prodigies over the years, I have a very good sense or eye for, for, for talent. And so based on hitting with a lot of young, talented kids, I, I can sort of feel you know, how they're connecting with the ball. Are they making the sweet spot almost every time? So they're tracking the ball really well and they're bringing it into the, the center of the racket with very few miss hits. That's a really good sign, even if the technique is bad. And the other thing is you, when you move the kids around, they're able to get to everything. They have a good foot speed. And what you're looking for, if you're trying to develop a pro or a world-class player, is you're looking for something really special in the quickness department and also in the stamina department. I can talk about that in terms of um, stamina, too, is a big part. The, the cardiovascular capacity, like the VO2 max of, of a young kid, is really important. How, how they perform in terms of their stamina and, and cardio is also a factor related to their running ability. But I look for, I watch their gait, I watch the way they flow on the court, I watch their balance and their grace, and also their, and of course their quickness and agility. So that's a huge part of it for me when I'm evaluating a player in terms of their, their physical talent. You got their eyes and their hands, and you have their feet, right? The way they, the way they, the way they move on the court, right? Thanks for the thumbs up, guys. Thanks for all the waves. I see some old friends and new friends on the show. I see my buddy Brian Bleem. What's up? Francisco Montoya, fantastic coach from New England. Give me a wave. Thank you, Francisco. Great to see you enjoying the program. If you have any thoughts or you want to share about talent, please let me know, Francisco. I, I know you've probably got some good experience working with some prodigies yourself. My buddy Steve Campbell, no, Stan Campbell says, Evening, Chris, go big, red, yes, go Cornell, all right. Cornell's not doing too badly these days. The whole Ivy League is, in, the tennis in the Ivy League is, the level of tennis in the Ivy League is incredible right now, uh, along many fronts. Unfortunately, I don't think Cornell is at the top, but the level of Ivy League tennis is 
astronomical, com uh, even, I, I think, compared to when I was playing. So, Stan says, Evening, Chris. Go Big Red. Stamina is critical. Yes. Okay. So, the stamina, here's something I was mulling about. been writing a lot this week. I've been posting a lot in my blog. If you have not visited my blog, it's prodigymaker.com. It's my home for all of my articles and all of my published writing pieces. And I, I put all of my postings there, all my thoughts, uh, philosophy and things like that. So if you're interested in my work and my writing and my coaching philosophy, go to prodigymaker.com and it's all free. It's a free site. It's just I needed a place to put all of my thoughts and ideas and all my writing. And I, I, I am... Uh, very busy writer. I was an um, English and literature major in college at Cornell and that's one of my my loves is to to write. So I, I'm writing a lot and where all of my thoughts and ideas go, they, they go to prodigymaker.com. So and it's all free. It is a repository for all of my stuff, all of my my writings. Check it out if you haven't been there before. Also I put a lot of quotes and wisdom from the Spanish legends. So I've studied with many Spanish le legends and and I tried to uh, put, uh, I have a, a section where we have quotes from all the great Spanish coaches and uh, different uh, advice and wisdom from the legends of from Spain like Pato Alvarez and Tony Nadal and Luis Bruguera and many many others. So check it out. If not, Stan Campbell says, enjoy doing tournaments for you Back then, stamina keeps you in the game physically and mentally. Yes, so here's my brief thought about stamina. If you have a young kid in front of you and you're trying to figure out what their physical talents are, right, they should be able to run very fast. If you put them on a simple test like a mile or a mile and a half, they should be blazing fast. And obviously it depends on the age, but I was just sort of throwing around some numbers. I have some students who run cross country, for example, they run 5Ks or 3Ks. I think most children should be able to run, if they're a little bit older, like between 10 and 12, let's say. This is very rough, rough estimation, but I was kind of bouncing around in my head. They should be able to run a 5K, you know. At least six, at least six minutes, maybe a little more, a little less, uh, six minutes per mile pace, just to be a, a top national player. You know that that's probably not even world class. And then I would expect a, a very, very uh, off the charts kid in terms of uh, stamina and, and good running ability to do better than that. So they run a 5K in in you know 18. 18 or less, maybe maybe uh, with a very special kid, even faster, or a mile in five minutes or less, you know, between, for a young kid, probably five minutes, very good, uh, under six minutes probably for a, a kid who is maybe like a national level kid, certainly not much higher than that. We do with those, we do a mile run in my academy in the summertime and the the most the, the national rank kids usually are are sub six minutes on a mile, uh, maybe if they're a little maybe they're a little older but that's also uphill. but basi basically, Sky if you want to be on the show you come join us here. So that's also like a giant hill. Okay, my daughter is tuning in. <laughs> she's chiming in her her advice. Come and join me if you want to join the show and talk about it. Right. So there there has to be a good running ability. They don't have to be able to run like Kipchoge. But they got to be able to run very well, and I think that stamina part's critical. The speed is another thing you should measure. When you have a little kid, the, one of the questions I ask them is I say, are you the fastest kid in your class? And I'm hoping that the answer is yes, right? Can you stop opening that? Because it's, it's noisy, and then on the podcast, it's going to sound real bad. Yeah. Do you need me to sign that? Right now? No, on the right show? Now, right now. I'm trying to run a professional show here. I can do it right now, but no, 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 no. You don't have to do it right now. 
Yeah. Sorry. Right it's my daughter. Put, Th this is a this is a professional program. Okay, you don't have to do it All right, I'll do it later. Thank you. Okay, so one of the things I ask, I ask the kids, are you the fastest kid in your class? And they better give me the answer yes, because if they're not the fastest kid in their little world, like with 20 or 30 kids in their class, that's not a good sign, right? And if they are the fastest kid in their class, I ask them, are you the fastest kid in your school or in your grade? And I'm hoping to get the jackpot of yes, we ran races, we were in gym class. I guess a lot of kids, there's not a lot of stuff going on in gym class anymore. A lot of gym class is getting cut out, but that's another story. But I'm hoping to get the answer, yes, I run in gym class and I'm the, the first one or I'm the second one always. I'm, I'm one of the fastest kids in my, in my grade or potentially I'm one of the fastest ones in my school. If they're the fastest one in their school, that is a very, very good sign. And you... You know, if it, sometimes I get kids who run track, so they actually know their times, their distances for 100 meters or 200 meters or 400 meters or 1,500 meter. And, and I think those, that's very interesting for me trying to figure out, sort of roughshod, but trying to figure out where, where a kid's physical talent lies based on those numbers. And I'm sure somebody has more exact numbers in terms of what, uh, you know, different ages, like what an eight or a nine-year-old should run. Or, but I'm looking for sort of the creme de la creme for someone on the way, way off the, on the corner of the bell curve, you know, who's very, very, a very, very gifted runner. So that means quickness and agility and, and also stamina. I'm looking for both, like a combination of both. Those are some of the physical things that I look for, the eyes and hands, and the, the, the running capability, that would be the legs and the feet, so to speak. And then you sort of get into some of the mental capacities. Uh, I would like to talk about that in a moment, and I have some interesting thoughts about that. There are, there's the, the, sort of the physical gifts of a player, and I'm very pragmatic. So on the court, I'm really obsessed with that. I want to know, uh, know about the physical gifts. And then there, there are also the more intangibles, like the mentality, the, 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 emotional, the emotional control, the way the kids wire. I, I guess, for lack of a better word, I guess I'll call them intangibles. The, the, X, the X factor, sometimes Rick Macy calls it the X factor. You know, the way a kid's wired, their character, their, 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 their things that are not their physical gifts, so to speak. But l let me briefly go back and and because now I'm thinking of some of the tests that I do with kids for the eyes and the hands so for example I have this great exercise that I do with every player who comes in to work with me and it's a little test and I have some little cones that I set up and when I'm playing with a kid I ask them in the warm-up for example okay we're gonna warm up and I'm I, I hit a very I still play a very good ball so I, I don't really miss that much I, I've maintained my level even as I'm getting older. So I'm like a wall. I, I don't make a lot of mistakes. And I ask the player, okay, we got five minutes here or ten minutes. I want to see how many times you can you can hit the cone or you can hit uh, a can of, I like to use a can of balls sometimes. A can of balls is a very good target for testing out a kid's control and a kid's ability to, to uh to place the ball where they want, even if they don't have good technique. That's the interesting thing. With a very gifted kid, if they have very good eyes and hands, if they're very well coordinated, they seem to be able to put the ball near where I want them to aim, even with bad form. So they just have, a, they have an innate, very good control of the ball. Tony Nadal would call it, they accompany the ball well, they feel the ball well on the strings and they're able to send it in uh, maybe not hitting the target every time, but in the general vicinity, very close to a target consistently. And that gives me a sense of their, their hand-eye ability. Like I said, even if they don't have a lot of skill, obviously the more skill they have, it's gonna be easier for them to direct the ball. But what I found is just informally, the most gifted kids that I've ever worked with, the ones that, that end up top in the country or have a chance to play pro, play top college, those kids are able to strike the target 
more frequently than, than others. And I notice that kids, sometimes you get a kid with very good form so that they've actually had very good technical training, but they can't hit target. They cannot put the ball accurately to a spot or to a, a cone or a, a ball can. And I just find it really interesting. I, I've done this test with hundreds of kids. I, I usually do it sort of as a, in my initial lesson and I, I, I monitor it as, as we go along sort of see if they're getting, if their accuracy is improving. Little informal test that I do. And we'll just rally up the middle. We'll just rally up the middle of the court and I'll see how many times I can hit a cone in, in a certain amount of time. And so it, it's interesting that some kids don't have good technique, but they can put the ball close to the target or hit the target frequently. And then other kids have really good technique, but they're not able to direct the ball well to the target. And the other thing that I observed during that time is I, I, I watched how they move, as I mentioned, some, looking for some of the physical gifts. I, I observed their balance. I observed their, their footwork. Are they sort of clumsy with their feet or do they move like a dancer? How's their, how's their foot coordination? How's their, how's their, their agility? Another test that I like to do is I will be just rallying with the player and I'll, I'll hit a drop shot from time to time because I want to see how quickly they react and how fast they can sprint to the ball. It also tells me a little bit about their mental qualities. Do they run for the ball? Are they obsessed with getting to the ball and getting it back over? Are they kind of lazy? Do they, they don't run? So those are, that's another little test that I do. So I'll just play and occasionally give a drop shot or a short ball and I like to observe how they move. If they move very quickly to that, they get to the ball with no, no issue or if they're, they struggle in their movement and if they're a little bit slow or clumsy, I, I, I observe that. And maybe some of these tests may sound very simple but for me they're very powerful because I've been coaching and playing, specifically playing, I played with a lot of very, very talented kids between the age of five and let's say 12. So I sort of had this weird esoteric uh, uh, knowledge about that age and how they play. Like I played points with lots of kids, hundreds of kids that age. And I'm, I guess I'm, I think that that is unique. Not many coaches have, have actually played and, and felt the ball and, and observed up close the way really a really gifted really gifted kids hit and that I guess that's just a weird stroke of luck that I've just happened to from the very beginning when I first started getting into coaching I had a chance to work with this kid TJ Pura who was an amazing prodigy he played I believe for Duke and TJ was my coach's student uh, Gilad Bloom and that was sort of my first exposure to a really, really gifted prodigy. TJ was an amazing little kid at, at eight or nine or ten. I, I used to, to hit with him and I used to go to his house in Bedford, New York and he had his own court and I used to play with him there and I used to play with him during some of Gilad's lessons and things like that. And I used to help out with his game and Gilad was his main coach and I used to help him. And that was my first chance to hit with a little kid and sort of be around a, a prodigy who was really, really talented and very special. I can talk about the mental qualities of those kids too. I, I've written a lot about the mental qualities of prodigies. Uh, those are some other things that I look for. So anyway, I just that's how I, I sort of got the ball rolling. And then over the years, I've, I've got a chance to play with many, many kids from, like I said, very young. Like I have this little boy, David Zaretsky really talented little boy. We started around uh, between four and five and now he's seven, turning eight. Amazing little player from Boston. You know, I get to play with little kids like that. I think it's very unique to be able to um, experience that and hit with very talented kids for the age, very precocious kids. So that gives me a perspective. And then when I, when I have new kids who come in to work with me, I, I like to play with them as long as I can still play. And, and uh, I don't see... Unless I have some major injury, I should be able to play with all, with a, with pretty much anyone who comes in for the foreseeable future. I keep building up that that experience and learning more and more about what what are the gifts of young prodigies. So that that's sort of where I'm coming from, and 
Yeah, what other tests do I do? Do I do any other little tests for, for young ones? Those are, those are the ones, the simple ones that I do to evaluate their eyes, their hands, their, I observe their, their movement and foot speed. I heard that Robert Lansdorp has a test for the eyes and the hands, and what he does is he, he shoots the ball up way high in the air, like a cloud touch, and, and he asks the kids to, I think they hit it off the bounce, or they have to take it on the rise. I read this in an article. Maybe it was in a podcast I heard it. It, it, it sounds like something Lansdorp would do. So it, it's basically he's evaluating the same thing that I'm talking about. He, he's hitting the ball way up in the air, and then the kids have to pick it up cleanly off the bounce like a short hop. And Lansdorp used to say that his best, you know, some of his best players were able to you know, pick it up cleanly, and others struggled. The kids that ended up more like college players, they struggled to pick up the ball. Uh, on the rise like that and that that's sort of the kind of test that I'm talking about I have my own little test that I do when I'm hitting with with young kids anyway I don't know if you guys find that interesting but but I I think it's kind of a it's definitely a, a unique thing I don't know many many coaches who've had been able to play with that uh, as many young talents as I have so anyway a little bit of uh, of background there and what about the mental quality? So Tony Nadal says that the most important talent, the, 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 the greatest talent, is the ability to learn. Uh, so I've been studying with, with Tony uh, online, getting certified with the Tony Nadal method. And I find that interesting that Tony makes that the number one, the, the number one talent that he looks for is the ability to learn. I don't know if I would say that that's number one. For me, I have sort of a whole group of talents that I'm looking for because I need... You ever imagine a video game, like a role-playing game, and, and you have the... I guess this is for the I generation, but you have all of the strengths of the, the main character of the game, you know, the level. Then they're all levels, like level 10 or level 100, and they, the, the video game character... I guess the avatar gets a score for for their 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 skill in in each in each area. So, for example, you have a player with a, a, a different strengths in different fighting skills and energy levels and defense and things like that. You know, I don't I don't play a lot. Of, I don't play any video games anymore. But I'm just saying, when I was a kid, I used to play a lot of video games. So it reminds me of a role playing game. So when it when a young prodigy comes in or any kid comes in, I'm sort of evaluate, evaluating them like a, like a video game character, if that makes sense. I think about, okay, if this was a, on a scale of 1 to 100, I give this player maybe a 95 on uh, quickness, a 90 on stamina, a, a 98 on hand-eye coordination, and then on and on, mental strength and and I have a whole sort of checklist in my mind. I haven't, I haven't codified it into an actual document. Like I don't actually go through a, a, a checklist where I write down the, the, the score. But I guess I could do that. But it's just sort of an informal thing that I do in my head. I kind of look at the kid like they're a video. You ever see? I, I'm dating myself. But you know like The Legend of Zelda or Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy is a great role playing game. Am I... I think I'm dating myself now. You know, these are cool games when I was a teenager or something. Okay. Do those still exist? I don't even know. All right. I don't like video games now. I don't like when my son plays video games. It wastes a lot of time. Anyway. So, but when the kid comes in, I'm like, okay, where do they score on all these different skills? And that, that's sort of how I talent ID them. And it's not, it's never, there's never one. Like, there's never just one or two talents. Because I think that one of the biggest mistakes coaches make, and parents too, this is interesting, parents make a lot of mistakes with talent ID. They, they pick out one or two categories that are good, and they don't realize that there's a bunch of other categories that they're neglecting to observe, or they, they discount those, those cat. They don't, they don't place as high a priority on those other categories, and then they get a, a false, a, they, they, get a, they, they falsely appreciate how good their player is. They give their player a uh, less value than they should or more value than they should, I should say. 
because they, they're, they're missing a bunch of other categories. So in their mind, their little RPG, their role-playing game characters, really, really talented, but they're missing out on a number of other categories that I'm, I'm evaluating, but they didn't know about. And that's sort of, I guess, what I'm trying to get at with this show is like, what are those categories? I mentioned those physical ones. There's one more physical one that's really, really important, and then we can talk about uh, the mental one. Let me just check on Sammy and make sure he's okay out there. Oh dear. Oh dear. He's out there in the, the cold. Sammy, get inside here, boy. Are you okay? Come on. It's like a rainstorm out there. Okay. Brian Bleem has a comment. Guys, I don't mean to drone on here. I'm happy to take your questions and we can sort of get into a debate or a discussion. And that's what this show is all about, too. It's not just about me. blathering on here, although I tend to, to ramble on a lot. Brian Bleem says, let's see, I have noticed that some of my kids are very competitive while others are not. Do you think that is something they are born with or they can adapt to become ultra competitive? Right, that's an awesome question and that's a really good one for the X factor, the intangibles, competitiveness or as Lansdorp says, being a competitor. He talks about being a competitor all the time. And I like, I like Lan Lansdorp knows talent. Let, let's put, you know, there are some coaches who are sort of in this business like me. They work with a lot of talented kids and they sort of, they have these, they have these ways of, of measuring or evaluating talent. It's fascinating to me. So anyway, so competitiveness, I think it's more innate. I think you can you can definitely improve a player's competitiveness, but I think a lot of it's in the DNA. And some kids are bare knuckle street fighters. They're brawlers. Sometimes I say they'll slit your throat and steal your wallet. They're they're killers basically. They have a killer instinct. If they were Recruited for the military, they would be snipers. They would be, you know, they would be infantry soldiers. They, they're killers, basically. They make great assassins. They have a killer mind, and those are the kids that I've observed make the best champions. There's something inside of them that is they cannot stand losing, almost to the point of of a psychological disorder. They hate to lose, like a personality disorder and they love to win, and they'll do anything to win. And when I see a kid like that who's really cutthroat, I've got, now, I, that's, that is a, one of those categories that I talked about, like video game character categories, skills that, that I value very highly. Are, are they like that? Are, are, they, are they a killer? You know, could they pull the trigger and shoot somebody? Could they slit someone's throat with a knife? Not to get too gruesome, but, but I'm serious. These, are, these, are, these kids are killers. You could have a little girl, six years old, cute as a button, but she's a stone-cold killer. And what I mean by that is she wants to win so badly, she'll do anything to win. Whatever. It could be at any, any age, really. But my point is, I think a lot of that's in the DNA. And what Robert Lansdorp says is that to try to turn a kid into a killer who's not really that competitive is probably a crime. It's probably wrong to try to change someone, and it's probably in some ways abusive. To try to turn a kid who's not hyper-competitive like a killer and, and, and make them that way, it's going to be bad. It's going to be probably very unhealthy to try to do that psychologically to a kid. Also, along the same lines, Brian, is uh, the competitiveness. There are different levels of competitiveness. So I mentioned at the far end, there are the killers, the, the, the army ranger snipers, the the, the MMA fighters, the, the basically good military recruits. There, there are those type of kids. And then it goes in a spectrum 
some kids are, are competitive. They enjoy winning. And they don't mind. They don't like to lose, but they don't mind it. You know, there's different levels of competitiveness. You go all the way down the spectrum to some kids who don't care about winning that much. Doesn't really bother them. They just play for fun. And they don't really want to compete. They don't mind losing and don't really like winning that much. You got to have a kid who really hates to lose and, and loves to win. Loves to win and hates to lose are the two combinations you're looking for. But it, it can go in many different levels from very, very extreme, like I said. And those kids usually have the X factor. That's one of the X factors to be a champion. And it can go all the way down the spectrum to the other side where you have a kid who is just shouldn't be playing tennis, really, because tennis is a sport for gladiators. Tennis is a one-on-one, -on -one, incredibly pressure-filled sport that's, that's meant for warriors. And they just want to play like a little doubles socially and never want to play a match. You know, those types of kids... I mean, they can play tennis, but they're probably in the wrong sport. Maybe they like hitting the ball a little bit, but that's not... I mean, what I do in high performance, I, I, I don't look for those kids. Uh, those are the kids I'm trying to weed out right away. That They're probably not going to fit into my philosophy or the way I... my methodology, the way I coach or anything like that. So I, I'm definitely looking to weed out those kids and find the, find the killers. Stone cold killers. Kids that are like, they frighten me a little bit in how badly they want to win. And, and some of the most elite kids that I've had, they're, they're like that. And what you try to do with those kids is you try to make them a decent citizen. You know, you don't want them cheating. You don't want them winning at all costs. You, you got to sort of try to, you got to manage them a little bit. They're like a wolf that's ready to pounce on every uh, every animal in, in the in the in the forest or in the field and you, you sort of have to you have to control them a little bit teach them some self-control they're like a wild animal and i much rather have a kid like that than a kid who's a sheep and try to teach a sheep how to fight or how to kill that that is not a good situation to be in but brian it's possible to make a kid a little more competitive but you're not going to turn a sheep into a wolf you know, you're looking for the wolves. If you want to build a top champion, junior player, or a kid who has a chance to go pro, you're looking for the wolves. You're looking for a predator. That's how I see it. Brian says, on a side note, talking about video games, there are some pretty good tennis games for the PS4, and I think it can help teach them how to play out the points correctly. I think it can also help them learn good form. Yeah, why not? You know, this is the I generation, Generation Z. And sometimes we got to teach kids in different and unique ways. You can connect to them through digital means. And using video games to connect with a kid is, can be good. But just be careful that you're not using valuable time up when you should be practicing for reals. Right? Brian Beam, Bleem also says, I think having a strong ping pong background has also helped me learn the point construction. Sure thing, Brian. Ping pong is great. And I... Just about every tennis player I know loves to play ping pong. And it, Bjorn Borg was an amazing ping pong player. That's where he learned his forehand from. So it can, it can influence your technique playing ping pong. And it can also uh, help your tactics. Sure, how to, how your patience. You can work on your mentality, your competitiveness when you play ping pong. Every tennis player. We have many ping pong tables at our summer academy. And... And a funny story about Bjorn Borg was he won a local ping pong tournament and the grand prize for the winning prize for, for, the, for the ping pong tournament was a tennis racket. And that's how he got started in tennis. Very cool story about the beginning of Bjorn Borg's tennis career. Anyway, let's talk about my number one talent that... Most people overlook, most people don't talk about, parents overlook, coaches overlook, is the number one talent that I've learned over the years is critical to, for, for a kid to be a, become a champion someday, 
It's also the one that you can't evaluate uh, on first look. You have to spend time with uh, a lot of time with the kid and and see how how they are in that department in that category. And what what the talent is is being resilient and being resilient when it comes to injury and not being injury prone. So I think that is a talent that's not talked about very much and it's huge. Really important to not be injury prone and to have a resilient body. And that can be at the cellular level, like players who are able to recover quicker, uh, metabolic level, uh, muscular and joint level, so uh, musculoskeletally. These are, are players who are able to, to put in a lot of work, put a lot of uh, damage onto their bodies, you know, to, to push themselves and to break down their bodies. And their bodies are, A, their bodies don't get, don't get a severe injury, so they're not prone to any catastrophic injury. You cannot have a catastrophic injury if you want to be a pro, if you want to be a, a, a top junior or a pro or top college player, you, you have to avoid catastrophic injuries. And really, even smaller injuries, which take a, a week here, a week there, they can really mess with your momentum as well. Players, there's definitely a spectrum of, of, of this talent where some kids are just, they just don't get hurt. And they can work as hard as they they can they can do gym, running, playing lots and lots of tennis, and they just they're very resilient, they recover quickly, and they don't tend to get injured. And for me, that is a really important talent, and it's not an easy one to evaluate, but you start to get a sense of it when you're working with a player over time, you start to really notice if a player sort of has a lot of nagging injuries or not, and you sort of have to figure out why they're getting injured, what's going on. But some kids get more injured than others. Some kids have a tendency to get injured more than others. And those kids, it's going to be very hard for them to get to the top. They're going to have a lot of stops and starts. They're going to have a lot of lost time. They're going to lose momentum. And I just think it bodes very negatively for the Pro Tour. Because on the Pro Tour, we all know what a grind it is. If a kid in juniors is already showing that they're very injury prone, it's not, for me, it's foreboding for the future on a future pro career. And you never know, because some kids might be going through a developmental phase and having some injuries due to a, a growth or something like that. But just as a general rule, it makes me very nervous when I see a young, talented kid who's getting a lot of nagging injuries or, or has a history of, of a catastrophic injury. Very bad sign. I think if you look at the, the players, the, the greatest players of all time, the players who are on top of the world, they've had very few injuries in their career. Roger Federer comes to mind who had a decade or more of professional tennis playing the whole grind, grinding tour, and I don't think he had one catastrophic injury. Hardly, I don't think he missed a Grand Slam, not once. You know, he had recently the, the knee injury, but just for, that's just one example of many. And then how many times have you heard of a very talented, quote-unquote, you know, talented player or kid who lost their career because of a catastrophic injury or they just had too many smaller injuries or minor injuries that just kept adding up and nagging and nagging and nagging, and they couldn't get to where they wanted to be. They couldn't reach their highest UTR because of, of something going on physically. So in the physical department, that is huge. And on uh, for my video game character, you know, you have some players, uh, some characters who, who are really good. No, I'm not letting you out there. You're not going out there because last time you peed all over the couch. No, I'm not doing it. No. Sorry, guys. Sammy wants to go to the couch tonight, but it's not going to happen because he peed all over the couch, and that's not, that's not cool. No, I'm not doing it. No. Don't even give me that look. All right. Oh, where was I? Okay. Should we talk about 
mental gifts, the X factors. Brian Bleem mentioned competitiveness. Thank you, buddy. That's a great one. I don't even think I was planning to talk about that one, but that, that's a very important one. How could I forget that? What about what Tony Nadal says? The ability to learn, being a good listener, being coachable, having a good character, being respectful. Tony Nadal talks about that. That is a talent. Not being crazy, being able to control your emotions, having a great focus, being a great student, all, all, all of those, those qualities are very, very important to success. And that is definitely a talent. What I don't believe is those things can work like magic on a player who doesn't have the physical gifts. Just don't believe that. I know, I know that some like to argue that it's all in the mind, where there's a will, there's a way. If you put in the hours, the hard work, you can get there. And I'm just not buying that. I, I think there is a baseline level of, of talent. And talent for me is all these different categories that I'm sort of talking about. There may be other categories that you guys have in mind. You share them with me because I, I'm always trying to learn and expand my, the categories that I evaluate kids on. But these are some of the, the, the ones that I use and definitely the ability to learn and the character, all these mental uh, gifts are, are very important. If you have a, a physically talented kid who can't focus, can't listen, it's disrespectful, very difficult to work with, they're not going to progress as fast as a kid who's a good listener, who absorbs everything you say, who takes notes and, and applies everything that, that you're teaching them, you know, that type of player is going to make more improvement, right? Going to improve faster. So this gets back to an essay that I'm, I'm writing on time and talent. And so my contention is that the more talented a kid is, and talent means, again, talent has... I've been to many conferences where some of some great tennis minds have defined talent in different ways and they've had trouble summarizing what it means to be talented. But talent for me is all of the aforementioned traits, like categories in a, in a video game, in a role-playing game, and probably a few other ones that I may, may have slipped my mind because I'm, I'm just speaking on this extemporaneously. But there are these, these categories, all there's the umbrella term talent, and then you have all these different categories underneath that determine what the, the absolute talent is. So they have subcategories of talent. And like I said, I don't, I, I, informally, I sort of give each player a number when I'm evaluating them, just, just in my, the back of my mind. I don't do it formally. And okay, so depending on how great a number they have, how great their talent number is, I know that they're going to progress faster. So they're going to get, and let's use UTR as a, a measuring stick. I, I love UTR and I, and I love the, the idea that we can measure progress with UTR rating and also that it's sort of a lifespan. It covers the lifespan of a player's development, UTR. So you can start out from the very beginning with the I guess uh, the lowest UTR that's available and you can work your way up to a 15 or 16 if you ever make it to uh, the highest level of professional tennis. And what I'm sort of describing is, and you could put this into a mathematical formula, I thought about sort of formalizing it and, and make it into a formula like a function, but there's a function of time and there's a, a, formula, a formula that relates to the amount of talent and and how, how long it will take a player to, to reach a certain UTR. And just, for example, if a kid doesn't have a certain amount of talent, they can't reach more than an 11 or 12 UTR. They're not going to be able to go higher than that because they just don't have enough sheer physical... Let's start with the physical gifts. I think that's a huge limiting factor. If a kid gets injured, has a lot of injuries, a kid's not fast enough, you know the one I forgot to mention? How powerful a kid hits the ball. That's a big one for me too. Is I look to see how much explosion 
uh, there is when a kid strikes the ball. The, the, the most gifted kids who I coach, they're able to produce very good power, even when they're young. Uh, and it, I think that's something in the, the, the muscles, like a fast twitch fibers. It's, they're, they're able to produce a lot of juice. They're able to jump high. They're able to swing and crack the ball. The ball makes a sound off their strings that maybe is not normal for their age. So that's the other thing I, I, I neglected to mention in physical gifts. But if you take their talent and you, 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 you calculate it over and you put it in an equation, th there's got to be a, a certain UTR that they cannot surpass if they don't have a certain amount of talent. Now, if they put in enough time, though, so talent, if you add in as much time as they can put in, they might be able to reach they might be able to max their, their, their ability. You know, if they put in enough hard work, enough time, who knows how many hours, 10,000 hours or, or, or more, if they, if they work hard enough, they have enough discipline, they can max out their potential UTR. But in my experience, most kids never reach their full potential UTR because they're usually they have a deficit. A lot of times it's, they don't work hard enough. So that's where sort of the, the talent code philo uh, 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 perspective sort of comes into play where you are all, your, your, your talent is how hard you work, right? How, how hard you're willing to go after and persevere uh, towards, uh, towards the goal of improving as a tennis player. For me, that is a huge part of your max, of reaching your max UTR. And I've sort of dabbled with putting this all into an equation, whether it's a, a function of time or a function of how hard you work, uh, and then also your talent number. I'm interested in putting it into some sort of mathematical, simple mathematical model, kind of interesting. But I think you can sort of start to predict uh, a player's max UTR, which is their literally their highest achievement in tennis. Like for me, I got to around a 13 UTR in my life. In my, as a player, I had some big wins in college over some top national, uh, national ranked players. And, you know, over the, over the years, I, I think I got to around 13 UTR. In my whole life, working my, my ass off, right? That's as good as I could get as a player. And that was a failure for me because I wanted to be a, a, a legitimate pro, a, a good ATP pro. And thir uh, uh, anywhere between 12 and 13 UTR means you're playing Division I and maybe playing some Futures, right? So that's sort of where I ended up in my whole life. So I worked, worked all those years, you know, uh, decades, right, to, to reach my max UTR. And that's, that's kind of a, the journey that I'm talking about. I think it's really interesting. After everything I did, you know, all of the hard work that I put in, that was where I maxed out. And for example, I think my actual talents, I, I have some that are quite low, especially physically. Like I, I'm not super, not the fastest kid, not, don't have the greatest endurance, but I'm, I, I think I'm, I make up for it with some of my hard work and you know, with the, you know how they say work ethic and things like that, and my, my focus and concentration. I'm a very, very disciplined, hard worker. So I sort of was able to get to a, a pretty decent lifetime UTR based on that effort. But I think I was always going to be somewhat limited because of my talent number, uh, especially on the, uh, the physical side of things was going to limit me. But for example, I've had a number of injuries in my career just my personal uh, life example, because I know it so well, I've had a number of serious injuries. I had, for example, I tore my MCL in my knee. Now that cost me a lot of time in, in terms of uh, development. And I think that if I, I had a more, a, a less injury prone body, I probably could have maybe got a little higher in my max lifetime UTR. Just, just for example, I, you can see kind of where I'm coming from. Now, sometimes you have a, a player who's super, super talented physically. They have these amazing physical gifts, but maybe they weren't willing to work as hard as me. 
I've played with a number of guys, practiced with a number of guys, 12, 13 UTR, and they're lazy. They, 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 didn't work as, they didn't have nearly the work ethic that I had or that I have now. But they were able to make the same level max lifetime UTR because they had more of, of the physical talent than I ever had, just genetically. And I find that interesting. I think they probably could have gone a lot higher if they had my mental talents, right? I think in many ways as a coach, especially as a high performance coach, I'm looking to find kids that have better physical talents than I ever had. And I'm trying to impart on them my mental strengths, my, my mental talents, my hard work ethic, my character, uh, all of those things that I mentioned. I'm a very good student. I, I, I wasn't when I was a kid, but now, as I got older, I became much more respectful and, and listened to all my coaches and things like that. So you guys see sort of the, the variables that I'm playing with here, the variables of this equation, uh, so to speak, very rough mathematical model of how, how you can uh, get, achieve your lifetime UTR. So related to coaches, right? So with coaches, hey, I see some old friends uh, waving. Thank you. David Getz, great coach. Hey, David, how are you? David, you know talent. And I still remember a workshop, USDA high performance workshop we did where you talked about how the kids you look to recruit, they love to win and hate to lose. I remember that very clearly, and we were in the same working group in that workshop. It was a high-performance coaching workshop, and I still remember that, and I still use it today. I use it on the show tonight. Champions, talented kids, they hate to lose, and they love to win. And you, you always said that you look for those kids uh, to recruit for your college team. I thought that was very interesting. So Jim Kane says, Jim's a big supporter of the program. Of course, talent is number one and can lead to success and can expedite the journey to success. But one needs all the building blocks of Coach Wooden's pyramid of success to reach the very top. He's talking about John Wooden, the legendary basketball coach. A top tennis coach can recognize the building blocks and be the cement to build a strong, solid foundation. As you know, Chris, we can learn from coaches in other sports, parents, teachers, and people the athlete cross paths with during their formative years. Absolutely, Jim. And I don't know. I'm not, I've read some of Wooden's work, but I don't know the pyramid. Maybe you can explain to us what the pyramid, what was part of Coach Wooden's pyramid. But the building blocks that you're talking about are sort of the categories that I've been discussing they are the the skill levels for the the video game rpg player you know for for the character and those are the building blocks that yes we as coaches need to sort of bring together and maximize and like you said be the cement for those building blocks that's a good way to put it that's a good imagery and our job as a coach is to maximize all of those talents right that's that gets me to the sort of the second thrust of the program, which is what makes a talented coach. And for me, a talented coach is able to maximize a player's gifts. And a talented coach is able to take a player to his or her highest, highest UTR, highest lifetime max UTR in as short a time as possible. If you remember on a previous episode of the show, I was talking about how tennis is not necessarily a marathon. It can be, it can be thought of as a sprint, or it's, it can be thought of as a marathon that you want to sprint, like Kipchoge. Kipchoge is the famous marathoner who broke the two-hour uh, two marathon barrier. He, he did a sub two hour marathon, which is incredible average between 420 and 430 per mile for an entire marathon, 26 miles. Incredible, incredible achievement. But for me, uh, the talent of a coach, what, how do you measure a coach's talent? For me, 
the best coaches, the ones who have the, the greatest gift for coaching, they're able to take a player along and speed up the learning curve for that player and take their talents and get them to their highest ability level as quickly as possible. And so I'm just fascinated by this relationship between time and talent, whether it's the time uh, for a coach, uh, a coach working with a player, or the time it takes for a player to reach their max UTR, their max lifetime UTR, for example. So here's the other thing. I think it's a fallacy and it's, it's wrong, it's wrong to, to say or, or, or to believe that if you just work hard enough, you can make it. Let's say you can make it to the pro level. Let's say above 14 UTR. Because to be a, a decent pro, you've got to be probably 14 or higher UTR. Probably going to put you in the top 800 in the world. Maybe you got to be 14 and a half to be eight, you know, somewhere in that, that area. And, okay, we usually sell this to a lot of our students. We say, if you work hard enough, so in the equation that I was sort of roughly describing, do you like my equation as an, as an, English, as an English major, my, my, my attempt at mathematics as an English major, an English and literature major? Anyway, it, I'm still interested in math. Okay, you have this equation, and we tell kids that if they, if they work hard enough, that they will be able to achieve this max number, they'll be able to be a 14, 14 and a half or higher UTR. And let's just be honest, that's not true, right? That's in some way, for some players, that's impossible. Based on the equation that I was talking about, if they don't have enough of the physical talents, if their talent number or their, their total talent number, you can go through in the subcategories, but if their, their total talent number is not high enough, they can work as hard as they'd like, but they're, they're not going to be able to, to get that, that big time result. They'll probably end up like maybe an 11 UTR or an 11 and a half, which is still pretty good. It's still going to play college at 11 and a half, but you're not going to be near a pro. So it's a bit of a fallacy to say that to young kids, but also we don't want to cut the dream short. We don't want to, uh, kids to to not work their hardest. So we sort of sell that to kids, and I do it too. I say, yeah, you can achieve anything if you work hard enough. But we should know that as, as adults who've been through life, that that is not always the case. I can tell you that I worked very, very hard to be, I always wanted to just, I had this dream to be a, an ATP professional, and it never materialized for me. It's one of the big failures in my life. It didn't happen for me. And I know that I, I, am a, I am innately a very hard worker. That's part of my character. So I think that we probably should keep telling kids that hard work is going to pay off, that they can accomplish their dream. But I'm always a little wary to say you can accomplish anything with hard work. Because your hard work is not going to override your talent number. Also, how does time fit into the equation? As I mentioned, I think there's a function of time happening within this equation. So what I mean by that is time is not infinite. If you want to achieve a 14 or 14 and a half max lifetime UTR, you're, you only have a certain number of hours per week to train, a certain number of days per year, and you only have a certain amount of time in your career to achieve that max lifetime UTR. For most people, that's between the age of from 5 to 18 years old. 18 years old is sort of an arbitrary endpoint for a lot of juniors, but some players will keep it going, keep the dream going through, let's say, 22, which is when they, more or less, when they graduate from college, right? And then that's sort of the end for most players. Now, some players will continue trying to improve their max lifetime UTR after college into their 20s and 30s, and that's very commendable. They give themselves more time. They need more time in the equation to try to max out their lifetime ability, right? And, and that, that is cool, but for most people, 
it's a it's there even then it's a finite amount. If you play into your 20s and 30s, it's a finite amount. But for most people, you have a limited amount of time to achieve your max lifetime ability. And in this case, I would use the UTR as that, an easy way to measure someone's lifetime achievement in tennis. It's really cool to have that rating now because we could never think about your your ability that way because it would only be ranking you know you'd have to get a certain ranking level I guess we could do it in ranking level but it's it's more interesting to me to see the 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 change in UTR the development of UTR over a player's lifespan which is which is a very cool thing about UTR so anyway let's say you have a, a week of training in front of you just getting to the near term right so here's another interesting part of talent and time for talented kids, really talented kids who have a, a high talent number, the big number that I was mentioning, right? For those really talented kids, they don't have to practice as much time to achieve the improvement in UTR, their, the improvement in their ability uh, week to week, month to month, or even year to year. So they, if, if, if assuming that their work ethic is a constant. They're working as hard as everyone else. And they, if they have a very high talent num number, they will, they will be able to, to train fewer hours. They will be able to spend less time than kids who have a lower talent number. So you see how I'm sort of formulating this equation. You have time. You have some sort of function of time. You have your talent number, and you have your also your your work, the work, the work, the intensity of the work that you're willing to put in. I, I maybe call it work ethic. Maybe that that's got to fit into the equation somehow, right? And what's interesting for me is the kids who I coach who are less talented. They don't have a, a high talent number. They don't have as many gifts. They have to work harder, right? And that's what we tell them. Right? We tell them that they have to work harder. But we also tell them this fallacy that it's a myth that, if they, that hard work can achieve anything. That's not true. Hard work cannot overcome certain limitations. But for example, a kid who's not as talented can achieve the same improvement in UTR week to week, month to month, year to year as someone with a higher talent number if they outwork that person. And luckily for many kids who have a lower talent number, the kids who are more talented, quote unquote, a lot of times those kids are lazy. They squander their time. They don't maximize their, their training, during, you know, let's say during a week, more during whatever time frame you choose. And I find that fascinating. You, you, how many times have you heard about the talented, quote unquote, player who is underachieving. And then you hear about a player who is less gifted, less talented, who's overachieving. And in the end, they're able to achieve a similar max lifetime UTR. And so th these are two classic examples. And then there's everywhere in between. But my point is, we definitely want to max out the work ethic side of the equation, the intensity of the work, the engagement with, with the work, the focus, and some of that is related to, to that is a, that we talked about the X factor of talents. And there's not much we can do about the physical talents. Those are genetic, primarily genetic. We can try to enhance them. Some of them are, are, are you can enhance, especially with young kids, you can train physical gifts and try to improve them. And, that's all well and good too, but let's just take the overall talent number, uh, the the gift, uh, the gift, the gift, the level of giftedness of a kid, and we're trying to get them to max out their 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 work, how hard they work. And what that means is is they, the kids with more talent don't have to put in as much time. That's the bottom line, and that may not be fair. So Tony Nadal was talking about this subject. In a recent course online I was taking with him, I was taking a class with him online, and he was talking about 
how the ability to work, let's see, how was he saying it? He was saying, it's great if you have talent and things take less time for you, but he said, sometimes with a kid, their, their great talent is their work ethic. He was saying their, their great talent is how hard they work, and those kids, it will take longer for them to achieve, but they still are tremendously talented. And I sort of disagree with that in, 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 in a way because time is finite. This is a really important point, that time is not infinite. For example, players have to go to school. And players have, uh, they have life responsibilities. They, they, if, if it takes, you know, Tony was talking about how it might take four hours for one player to learn a skill but for another kid it might only take him an hour or a half an hour and he was saying don't don't discount the player who it takes four hours with if they have a tremendous work ethic they can still be great you know they can still be a great player but what I'm saying is yes that's true but it's gonna be such a harder road for them because they're gonna to have to spend so much more time to achieve a, a certain skill level or to achieve different skills and the whole journey is going to take them a heck of a long time. A heck of a lot longer than it would take the kid who can learn something in a half an hour or an hour. This fascinating uh, class, uh, and, and Tony was talking, was talking about this, this, this subject. Because time, we all have limited time. In today's society, we know how, how we're so pressed for time. And everyone is talking about how we expect instant gratification. We expect things to happen quickly. Time is compressed, especially here in New York City where I live. Everything has to happen fast. It's the, everything's fast paced. You know, the world is, the time, time in the world is, is moving uh, quicker and quicker, right? And we expect things, we expect things in an instant. The, we, we live in the I generation uh, where we, where. Uh, you can get instant gratification and instant information and, and answers to everything in, in, a, in a moment. And, and we expect development to happen very quickly too. But it's, it, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes it will take longer, more time than, than, than we, we would like or than what parents would like or even coaches or the players themselves. But my point is that time can run out. So if a player is a very slow learner and it takes them a long time to learn a skill or to make progress or to improve their UTR, they, they can literally run out of time. That may be at 18 where they have to go to college and they may get recruited at 16 or 17 and they'll run out of, run out of, some, they'll run out of time to improve their UTR. Or that may be at 22 or or. And later in their 20s or 30s, where if they keep playing the game and try to improve, they could run out of they could run out of time. And then what they're left with is their max lifetime UTR, their their max achievement. All right. Anyway, I thought it's interesting. I, I don't buy what Tony Nadal's saying. He's saying that the talent of being able to work hard is as special as the 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 the, the basically the physical talents, you know, the, the talent of picking up a skill quickly. And I don't think they're equivalent. I think the hard work is really important, but there's going to be limitations on your time based on, on how, how quickly or slowly you learn. And there's going to be your overall talent number that, that I described that's made up of all those subcategories. There, that's going to affect your max lifetime ach uh, achievement, what you can do in tennis. Or, and this goes for any sport, by the way. I think if I was looking at any athlete in any sport, you could start to break it down this way. And I would probably look for the same types of talent. Anyways, these are some, of some thoughts for uh, an essay that I'm writing. I haven't published the essay yet, but it's called Time and Talent. I'm just sort of mulling over these ideas. They're not fully formed yet. As you can see, they're in inchoate. But they're, they're interesting to me, These, the subject of time, talent, hard work, and sort of like putting together an equation related to UTR, something that, that's on my mind. Appreciate you guys uh, listening and, and watching and tuning into this. I have a lot of comments that I will 
try to get to now. Let's see what Jim Kane says. Thank you, thank you for contributing to the dialogue tonight, Jim. Jim says, building blocks for John Wooden. And I, I really am a big fan of John Wooden. I haven't read his books, but I've read a number of articles about his coaching. So building blocks are enthusiasm, industriousness, discipline, competitive greatness, maybe that's competitiveness, loyalty. Those are from Wooden's Pyramid of Success. Yeah, those are great, right? These are some of the X factors, like the category of X factors. And you could probably have a subcategory within the X factors, right? All of these mental and character qualities, emotional qualities that make up someone's personality. Those are good. Enthusiasm's great. I would include like positive energy there, positiveness versus negativeness. Some kids are very negative and that can affect their, their rate of development. Uh, Jim says, especially the love, he loves the definition of success at the top of the pyramid. All right, check it out. If you guys are fans of John Wooden or have never read anything about Wooden, amazing, legendary basketball coach, you can check out his pyramid Pyramid of Success. I, got, I will have to review that myself. Jim says, success is the peace of mind when you put the effort to become the best that you are capable of becoming. Right, so that, and that's, that's the journey, right? I feel on a personal level that I did very well to become, to, to achieve the max lifetime UTR that I achieved, to become a, a good Division I tennis player, to play number one for my Ivy League team, to, to play some pro circuit. I, I did, I have a, I accomplished a lot as a player, but I, at the same time, I, I feel really disappointed that I didn't do better, that I couldn't achieve more. And I, I do have the peace of mind that I, that I work very hard. I think as hard, I don't know if I can say as hard as, as anyone, but I think that I definitely worked incredibly hard to get to where I, I, I am or I was as a player. So I'm, I'm gratified for that. But there's always the, the feeling of disappointment. Jim says, Chris, you are a success after your tennis playing journey, according to that definition. Right, I, I, I realize that, but also there's always going to be a sadness and a, a feeling of failure. For me, and I don't like to talk about my playing career too much because it's, it was kind of a painful journey and there's a lot of sacrifice and a lot of uh, many years of training and, and all that hard work and to never achieve the big dream is a big, I still feel it's a big failure for me on a personal level. So I, uh, a lot of my students and uh, parents, they, they want to talk to me about it. And I was like, yes, I will talk to you about my playing career, but... I don't want to talk too much about it because it's going to make me really angry and I'm going to feel dis a big disappointment and sad. So I talk about it a little because I want to share my experiences with my students, of course, and help them. But I don't like to get into it too much because I don't want to have a, a pity party and I don't want to get angry. I, I still get, I have the fire, the competitor's fire inside of me that, that feels like I really, I really blew it. Right. I couldn't, I, I didn't achieve what I should have. Uh, generally, Jim says, if a coach and player buys into it, that process can lead to success. So don't let your players start hugging and kissing the trophy too early. All right, great thoughts, Jim. Guys, you can always check out Jim's comments uh, on the Facebook link on the, on, the, on the show post. If you're interested in checking out his thoughts, he's got a lot of thoughts here. Jim, you're blowing up the program. Brian Bleem says, hard work beats talent when talent fails to work hard. Great quote. Yes, and I think that's exactly what I'm getting at, right? I'm saying that hard work can definitely beat talent or match talent, can equate to talent. But if talent works equally hard, it's not going to happen. And we don't want to sell that pipe dream to children, do we? Or, or do we want to try to give them that illusion? Maybe it's best that they shoot for the stars, right, and, and come up a little short. That's okay, right? 
Jim Kane says, yes, at Hilton Head in February, that was the title of Emilio Sanchez's presentation at the PTR conference. Wow. Did Emilio say that? Yeah. Emilio has a very personal story. Emilio Sanchez is a famous Spanish player and coach, and he has a very personal story of he was, when he was a junior in Spain coming up, he was actually, I believe it was, he was thrown off of the, the junior national team or he lost federation support, as, as the story goes. And so they, the, the federation of Spain didn't feel that he could be a professional. And so Pato Alvarez his, uh, be, took him on and believed in him and through sheer hard work and grit, they, they made it. And Emilio Sanchez, I believe, maxed out at number seven in the world, if I'm not mistaken. And he was number one in the world in doubles. So what UTR is that, guys? So his max lifetime achievement is probably a 15 or, or, or higher in UTR, right? And that's from a player who the Federation of Spain said didn't have enough talent. So I think that's what Emilio is sort of referencing, referencing there in that title of his, his presentation at the PTR conference. But Emilio has a great story about, about that. And Pato Alvarez talks about that a lot. The legendary Spanish coach Pato Alvarez always mentions the work ethic of Emilio Sanchez. You can still, by the way, see that work ethic today as Emilio expands this incredible academy, Sanchez Casal, all over the world. He's got four locations now, and he's an incredible business person and a very professional leader in the tennis industry. You can see the, the industriousness of Emilio Sanchez, and you can see how hard work can bring you incredible success. But the point is that he had some talent. It wasn't like they just you know, Pato Alvarez just took him off the street. I mean, Emilio Sanchez was still a very highly ranked junior in Spain, and he obviously had enough talent to make it to a 15 UTR, you know, top 10 in the world level. And my point is that some, some kids just don't have that talent, and it's a little bit, it is misleading for us to say to those kids, you can achieve anything with hard work. That's not true, right? That's a myth. Brian Bleem says, I guess this would be, would be better. Hard work can beat talent when talent fails to work hard. Yes, that's what we're describing here. So, guys, it's been an awesome show. I thought we were going to maybe get into talking about cheating, but you know what? Let's leave it for next week. The discussion on talent has been really cool, and I appreciate everyone tuning in and sharing their thoughts. I think that as coaches, we need to try to maximize our players' talents and we need to try to move them along as quickly as possible. Time has this, this, this unique relationship to talent. We need to understand that when a player is less talented, first we need to make a, a proper assessment of the talent. And then when we have a player who is less talented, right? God, I use talent a lot in this in this show t tonight, and I know that some coaches, I, have you ever heard that some coaches won't even, they won't even mention the word talent, it's like a dirty word, a taboo word, so I, I am certainly not afraid to use the word talent, but I'm using it, and I've defined it in my own way, using these different subcategories, right, so the, the thing is that we need to understand as coaches, when a player is less talented, quote unquote talented, we got to get them to work harder, and we need more time. So if you have a less talented kid, bottom line, you have a less talented kid who's going to a really tough private school, who's doing five hours of homework a night. Okay, what's up, Sammy? What's up, buddy? You got to go to bed. You're not napping tonight. You're wired, huh? Sammy's enjoying the show. He's been up all, all, all the whole time here. He hasn't been napping at all. So... The, the bottom line is a kid who's less talented, right, who is doing a ton of after-school activities, a lot of homework at night, really tough private school, for example, 
you can't say to that kid, hey, it's just, just work hard within your, your uh, two hours after school and you're going to make it. You're going to make it to a 14 or 15 UTR. That's not, re- that's not real, right? Now, if you, have a, if you have a kid who's off the charts talented, got a super high talent number, they might be able to achieve more with less time. And our job is to try to, over the long term, the long, the long arc of development, our job is to try to accelerate, to, to, to get the kids to their max UTR as fast as possible. I think that is the ultimate, ultimately is the, the measurement of a coach's talent. That is what makes uh, a great coach, a legendary coach, is someone who is somehow able to accelerate a player's improvement and get them to their highest achievement level, their highest ability level in the shortest amount of time. And I think the legendary coaches of all time, they're able, they've been, they found a formula to do that. It could be, there, there may be different ways to quickly get to the top of the mountain, to get to the peak, but they found a way to do it. And, and that is how time relates to measuring a coach's ability. And that's why I always say that the best coaches develop kids faster. Now, the kid may, may not have as much talent, relatively speaking, so they they won't ultimately get to the highest UTR level as someone with more talent, but the best coaches are able to help them achieve their best potential uh, playing level as fast as possible. If it takes one coach two extra years to get a kid to 14 UTR or 13 UTR or whatever UTR you're, you're using as a metric, and it takes another coach... Uh, two, it takes another coach two years less. If there's a two-year differential, in my opinion, the coach who's able to get the player to, let's say, 13 UTR in two years less time, that coach has more talent. That coach has more ability. And that, I think, is the key, uh, for co- the key takeaway for coaches and also for parents who are looking to judge coaches. Parents have a notoriously difficult time discerning who is a better coach than another. And that gets back to training systems and training methods. Maybe a topic for another show. But what a coach chooses to train, what a coach chooses to prioritize at different times of a player's development, that's going to affect how long it takes to reach the max UTR of a player. And in my opinion, a lot of coaches waste a lot of time. They, their systems are not efficient. That's why I talk about how to teach modern technique to young kids uh, early on, try to save time. I'm always talking about how to save time. If you ever come to one of my workshops, uh, one of my coaching presentations, I I talk a lot about saving time, finding the the best, most efficient way to develop a player. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. I'm trying to always think how can you quickly get a player from A to B? Uh, How do you get a player from A to B in the fastest way possible to save time? So anyway, that, that's how I see it. You have to always analyze your, yourself as a coach and say, yes, don't ever rest on your laurels. Don't ever say to yourself, well, I developed uh, this player to 13 UTR and I developed this player to 14 UTR and I, ha- I developed this national champion and this professional player. Always ask yourself, okay, I did that, but now... With the next kid who has that amount of talent, can I shave the development time down? Can I do it in, a, in less time? Can I find a way to streamline my process, my method, to make it more efficient and better? And I think we should all be trying to do that, trying to develop a more simple, simple and efficient way to develop our players. So with every player that I work with, after I have uh, successes... I go back to the drawing board and I say to myself, okay, with this next kid coming in, how, do, how can I do it a little better? How can I develop the forehand a little faster? How can I develop the complete game here so this player can uh, uh, max out their UTR a, a year sooner than I did with this other player that I coach? You know, that kind of thing. I think we should always be challenging ourselves to work faster and better and to shave the development time off uh, uh, for our players. So that's my parting thoughts about that. 
Guys, thank you for all of the waves and all of the participation. It was an awesome show. I hope you enjoyed this little bit rambling talk. But as you can see, uh, an inter interesting discussion about time and talent and coaching. And we'll have to talk about cheating next time on the program. If you notice, if you look at the show notes for this, for all the episodes, this is episode 26. If you look at the show notes, you will see that we talk about cheating a lot on this program because I think it's just a travesty. It's just an embarrassment that junior tennis allows cheating. So we'll have to talk about it again. I'm just, I was thinking to myself, you know, all you talk about cheating so much. That's kind of repetitive, but it's a really sore spot for me. It's an issue that I take very personally. I have a lot of my students who are being mistreated or having bad experiences in junior tennis, and I'm just going to keep talking about it and keep using my platform as an influencer and, and maybe people will start listening and we'll get uh, a change, some type of change in, in the structure of junior tennis tournaments where cheating will someday not be part of junior tennis. It's not part of other junior sports. I don't know why it has to be part of our awesome game of tennis. So we'll talk more about that probably on the next program or definitely in a future program because talking about cheating a lot, but we should not have cheating in junior tennis, such a shame that players have to experience this taint on our sport. Okay, guys, if you like the show, thumbs up me. Thank you for all the waves. Please share. Help, uh, help us grow the audience for this program. As I mentioned, we are now getting several hundred viewers and listeners per week. For me, as a... Uh, I'm not a famous coach. For me, having that level of audience per week is really, I'm very proud of that. And I appreciate all your support. If you could help us by sharing the show with friends and with other folks who might enjoy the program, people that have junior players or are involved with high performance, please uh, let them know about the program. Let them know that they can watch the show on Facebook Live. They can ask questions. They can watch the show on YouTube. Uh, all of our archives are on YouTube, and they can listen to the show at their leisure, on at their convenience, on all of the podcast platforms now. So I'm super pumped. I would like to grow the audience into the thousands per week. Right now, we're at several, several hundred. I, I look at the statistics every week, and it's very encouraging to me to see that people are enjoying the program. It's a very simple show. It's basically myself sharing my thoughts and philosophy and answering questions and, and uh, from viewers from around the world. And also from time to time, we, we get some very intelligent commentary like tonight, very intelligent commentary from uh, a number of leaders in the tennis industry. So I think uh, the simple format is, is winning and also having the show available in many different ways because people are busy. I think that is helping to grow the show. I really appreciate you guys if you could share with friends and help us build our audience. Thank you so much. Have a great night. God bless. See you on the next show.